another episode of Federico Talks Watches. I'm just checking the levels. Uh, I'm just sitting here with my friend Matt. How you doing, brother? I'm doing all right. How you doing, buddy? Good, man. Well, you're in Miami for the day. Yes. And if you guys don't know Matt, he is not only a really good friend of mine, but he is one of the quintessential awesome collection like watch collectors out there. If you guys are in the Facebook groups, you've seen his pictures. Um, in fact, I'm going to plug uh, Turbion001. Is that right? Yes. Yeah, Turbion001 on Facebook. Link in the description. Go follow his photo blog. Um, but we're, we're in Miami, and we're going to talk not only a little bit about his collection, but also about the 5711. Because Matt has a lot of experience getting some very difficult pieces. And I think there are very few people as qualified as you to talk about how the market works on getting these weird, or not weird, but difficult things. Maybe hard to get pieces, yeah. Exactly. So I guess before we get started, I'm wearing a Speedmaster. <laughs> and, and I'm not wearing a watch. But behind us. <laughs> Um, well, why don't we talk a little bit about what's behind here, and I'll do some close-up shots after. But okay, cool. Why don't we start over here? All right, so this is a Paddock uh, 5235. It's pretty unique because it's a regulator dial, um, which is something that Paddock just doesn't do before this watch. And it's also an annual calendar. And the thing I really love about this watch is the dial is like a, a brushed, it's got a like, texture. It's right? got a texture to it. And then inside you have the guilloche versus the brush. And it's just That's such a cool contrast. dial. You know um, what I love? Blue and gray is a killer combination. And it's I, not I agree. Awesome. No, I totally agree. So this is kind of a cool watch. It's an annual calendar. And um, it's a little dressier than little what you dressy, normally yeah. go for. Um, which is funny because the piece right next to it is the polar opposite. Yeah, so this is a, a Pam 87. Uh, I believe this was the last Tritium Pam. Yes, I, I had a Pam 194, but I don't know if that's before or after. Right. So this has got such a, a pretty blue dial, and uh, the way the dial patinas is really cool because you'll, you'll have like three different colors. Uh, just the way it patinas originally, and it's it's a cool watch. It's just a tough ass watch. This is a tank. I mean, when I put this thing on, I feel like I could take it off and use it as a hammer if I had to. Forty? Is that a forty-seven it's or a forty-four? Forty-four. Forty-four, and it's got. This is a little weird because the movement in this is a value seventy-seven fifty, and you can feel the wobble without a chronograph. Right. It's like why, why would you do that? You know. I'm, I think it's a really robust movement, and this watch was made when Panerai's were still like a value play. I, oh, you mean, I, have you seen the, the new stuff? A 30 meter water resistant? Well, yeah, I mean, this was when Panerai was a value play and it actually had value. Now they've reduced the price and there's a reason they reduced the price. Yeah, I mean, I'm a huge Panerai, and it pains for me to say, I even get shit from you guys for it, the new stuff is just it's not right no and, and i think the average panerai fan that's been with panerai for a long time is feeling like they're getting shafted if there's no new panerai i would want to buy it right now Nothing. and this is coming from the guy that when i worked at wempy on fifth avenue i would spend hours staring at the panerai case all i wanted was that one and that one and that all i wanted was panerai now i can't pick one model no uh, well, I think you're going to like this next one. This is featured once before, and if you're an horological aficionado, this is awesome. So this is a uh, Lange 1815 split second Rattrapon, and um, <laughs> it's just a beautifully made watch. The movement on the back of this, you'll have to link a picture of it. I'm, I'm going to take some B-roll. This is the one watch that should be worn upside down. It's Absolutely. I mean, it's just layered and you can look into the movement and I mean every time I look into the movement I see something new that I've never noticed before and the depth and the color it's just it's a fantastic watch. If you guys don't know you know who Philippe Defour is of, of course. course. If you guys don't know Philippe Defour, independent watchmaker probably considered to be 
the highest end watchmaker today? Is that is that a fair assessment? I mean, his simplicity is time only, and it's selling at auction for two hundred and fifty grand. Exactly. So it's highly appreciated by collectors. Well, Philippe Dufour said Lange was the first brand to ever create a chronograph purely for luxury's sake. Like they created the movement not to be. I mean, it is reliable, but their main objective was it was to be luxurious. Absolutely. When you when you use the pushers on on this watch, they just it's a it's like a click. You could feel the click, but it's so soft and it just is a pleasure. Whereas even a Patek Philippe, when you use the pusher on it, it just takes a lot of pressure. And <laughs> don't even compare it to my speed. Well, master. and you, <laughs> to a Valjoux 7750 or a Speedy. Uh, but I mean, just Hold just game. feel the pusher on this. It it's here's the thing: the pusher play, and this is difficult to describe on video, but it's very um, deliberate. Absolutely, like a little bit of force feedback, and then it just pops in. It was built that way. And it, but it's just a, a real pleasure. It's not a, a click, or you don't have to wrench the the chrono uh, pusher to make it actually work. And this is also perpetual? It's a perpetual split second. Two grand complications in one watch. Yes. In fact, the one thing for anybody have to complain is it's it's not exactly a thin. It's watch. not thin, but when you when you put the the uh, split second on top of the chronograph, it, it adds a lot of height. It's modular. So yeah, so know. I mean even if you look at a, a five thousand four from Patek or mm -hmm. uh, a fifty two oh four. They're thick watches because it's modular, and you know, the uh, the split second module is on top of the chronograph. Well, particularly the chronograph. I mean, chronograph. Anything chronograph, be it split second or simple chrono, those are the thickest modules to put because yes. a perpetual is all disc based, right? It's a yeah. gear train, flat discs. This has a lot of uh, you know, kind of hammered. I don't even know the proper names, but it, it's got a lot of thicker parts. Right. Going around. And then we have something. So, so you just. <laughs> oh my God. So you get bagged on for this. But <laughs> oh what? my God! Don't do. Don't start this kind of worms again. Oh man. So I actually really like this watch. <laughs> oh my God. And, and Fed asked me. He said, "Just be honest with me before we started shooting." He said, "What do you think of the Grand Seiko?" And I said, "You know, if I was a brand new collector and I had forty-five hundred dollars or you know five grand." To spend, I wouldn't buy a Grand Seiko, and it's not because the watch isn't a good watch. I clearly, it's a, a good watch, and I it's like it. It's still in your collection. It's still in my collection, uh, and I actually bought another one. I bought a Snowflake. Oh, what? Yeah. So we're going to talk about that later. So, so I really like the watch. It's fantastically made. This is kind of crazy. If we took money completely out of the equation, there's not a Rolex in the lineup right now stainless steel Rolex that I would rather have than this watch right now. Listen, that is very fair. Okay, that's a very fair assessment. However, you can't just say, if I was a new collector and had five grand, I wouldn't buy it. However, this is, I'd have this over a Rolex. Explain the first part of your statement, just because I'm gonna get hate and I feel like we think the same way and it's okay. been very hard to articulate. Man, I've never gotten YouTube hate, but I imagine I'm gonna get some now. Just be honest, I mean, that, that's the thing. I had never owned a Seiko before maybe a month and a half ago. Okay. And the first Seiko I bought was a complete value play. It was a, uh, a diver. It was a turtle, I think it was. Uh, that was the second one I bought. Okay. Uh, it was a um, uh, SKX. Oh, sure. Everybody said it. So I bought an SKX, and I was like, wow, this is great to beat around in. And then I bought AJ's Turtle. All right. And then I bought uh, an... A 35, an S -A S A R A Sarb 35, which is like the yeah. classic uh, date just comparable Seiko. Kind of and thing. and then I got this one, and uh, I just it was hard for me to think about spending that much money on a Seiko, but now that I have it. It's a fantastic watch, and it is absolutely worth the money. And to be clear, you you won that. In a I raffle. I won that in a raffle, yeah. But I didn't win the the snowflake. I paid for the snowflake. You paid for the snowflake. See, that's what I said too. Grand Seiko's fantastic. 
I can't knock on it, but I have a little bit of a mental block, you know, probably due to marketing and probably due to my time in the Swiss watch industry. Absolutely. Where it's tough for me to spend five minutes. If this was a Japanese independent and it said his name on there, he'd charge 20 grand and it would sell out. Which is why I think the new Grand Seikos that don't say Seiko, they just say Grand Seiko, that's a really smart marketing move. It's gonna, I agree. It's going to stop people from I agree. kind of getting that message. So, so the real question is, so this one says Seiko, do you think these go up in value? In my honest opinion, and I had a customer uh, ask me this the other day, I think right now they're tanking in value because everybody wants the Grand Seiko, Grand Seiko. Right. In 10 years, when like it's a thing and Grand Seiko's more established, Everybody's gonna want the of course, Seiko only. Absolutely. It's just it's like it's like the well, what's a good example? Like what it's like the original Milgauss. Remember when, when it came yeah. out in the seventies? No one wanted it. No one wanted it at all. William Messina, uh, who I've never met, but I love his Instagram, said he bought an oyster quartz over a Milgauss at Booker when he was a kid. <laughs> And, I mean, kick himself in the ass nowadays. I mean, well, the good thing is, is this is never going to leave my collection because uh, I have a nine-year-old son. Um, oh. So sometimes I make little videos, and, and he reviews watches just to get a completely unbiased opinion of someone that knows nothing about watches, and they're kind of fun. And uh, on my Facebook uh, watch blog, I have some of those videos. But this is absolutely going to be his first watch. When he's like 16, maybe 18. Absolutely, man. I because, can see how that works. Yeah. yeah, because he can appreciate it. It'll be a really nice watch, but it's uh, you know, it's it's not one of those watches where someone's like, oh my God, you're an 18-year-old kid with Rolex. And it'll humble him. Yeah. Because he can't walk around saying, take nope. a look at the Rolex. Nope, he's going to be like, this is my Seiko. So that's, that's a really smart that's his That's his first watch. And then next, moving along, is a watch I... I said when you open your watch box, you have a Longue that's, we're not going to say the price, but it's worth more much more than 100 times what this is worth, more, okay, or but, close to it. But this watch is really cool, so I, have, I, loved it. Nope. I have a lot of friends that are all into vintage. I like vintage, but the vintage market to me is a minefield. If you don't know exactly what you're doing, you can buy a watch that someone says is worth $50,000, and maybe it's worth... $10,000 because something's been switched and it might not be right. Yeah. But uh, I had a friend, uh, his name is Adam. His, can I plug his? Please. His uh, Instagram is uh, Mental Watches. He's a, he's a cool guy. And uh, so I called up Adam and I said, you have a Gruen on your, uh, on your site and I like it. It's got three colors in the dial, chronograph. It's got pretty decent size for being a vintage watch. I think it's about 36 millimeters. Which for a vintage chrono, I mean, is, is big. And, uh, and he said, yeah, I'll sell it to you. So uh, not knowing anything about it other than I just really like the dial, I said, okay, I'm going to just trust Adam and I bought it and it's been a great watch. And, and, and here's the perfect example of a brand that isn't necessarily sought after, but this watch is all about the dial. Yeah, absolutely, and the dial is very clean on it. It's got red, white, um, blue, and then a, a black background. And if this was a Hoyer or a Universal Geneve, uh, oh God, Universal. Or, or a Rolex, the, the price would have been 20 to 30 times more than it is because it's a Gruen. Yeah. And not being a vintage guy, I was I was okay with what it was. So it's just fun, fun to wear. Fair enough. And then this one, this is your one of your newest acquisitions? Yes, and uh, since I've gotten this, I can't take this off. So this is a... This is all you because I know nothing about it. Okay. This is a Diva Thune, which is um, a very small Swiss brand. Uh, I think they're made in Geneva. Not 100% sure on that. But they make uh, between 100 and 150 watches a year and uh, very finely finished watches. And the cool thing about this, I don't know if you can see it in the, this far away, but the lugs articulate. So no matter what size your wrist is, it just is super comfortable. And the case is made out of rose gold, but the lugs are made out of zirconium. So it's, a, it's, a, it's light. It's not a very heavy watch. It's very comfortable to wear. A lot of people call this the Star Trek. Um, it definitely has a Star Trek look to it. And this has the 
three D. Is it a moon phase? It's a three D moon phase. Three D moon phase. So it's actually a sphere, guys. It's not a disc. It's a sphere that rotates. I've actually never set the moon phase. People uh, ask me what what it is. I tell them it's a moon phase. And they're like, so it's going to be a full moon out tonight. I, I don't know. <laughs> I, I, I don't. It's my favorite complication. I've never set it either. <laughs> Um, but On my is... perpetual calendar watches, I like to set the moon phase at full because it looks good in pictures. That's true. <laughs> that is true. Yeah. And we just lost battery. So uh, there's going to be a little weird cut in there. Okay. Sorry, guys. But uh, we went from the dead bethune. We've got one watch left. So the last watch is a watch that I wanted to make look vintage. It's not vintage. Uh, it's a platinum long one that I bought this like chintzy bracelet for because I see all my vintage friends put these on their vintage watches. Maybe like the shittier the bracelet, the, the better the yes. vintage. Yes. So I put this uh, $130 like just chintzy, probably made in China bracelet on. And uh, some people like it. Most people hate it. I like it. <laughs> I kind of like it. I kind of like it, but I think it's not made that well. I think it'd probably scratch the case, so I'm probably yeah, gonna take it off. Yeah, aren't you worried about the steel platinum rub-a-dub, you know, like... It's... Yes, and now I'm getting anxiety about it, but... Oh, no. You know what, we should, we should, this is not my watch, but, uh, you, you should tell the story of this watch, how you sold that to a good client, and... Well, so I sold this to, to, to a friend of the channel, and respect his privacy, I'm not gonna say who, and uh, actually, he completed a Trinity today because of you. Okay, so yeah. So congratulations, sir. And there's a tiny little scratch right on the bezel. And, you know, he calls me and he's like, listen, there, there's a little scratch on the watch. You know, this is after you wore it a few times. Can you, can you handle it for me? I'm like, yeah, sure, no problem. And that's the difference between good dealers and bad dealers. Well, here's the thing. <laughs> this was in New York, right? So I go to my polisher, and he's like, Royal Oak? No. No. <laughs> <laughs> I go to AP, and they're like, Yeah, sure, I, Eight, I, I $850 have, probably. Well, I know those, I know them, right? Right. So they're like, we'll polish it if you service it. I'm like, the watch is new, it doesn't need a service. Um, so I gave it back to him, and he just came to Miami, and he, he brought it back because Hansi knows everybody and if Hansi can't do it himself there is someone he knows absolutely that can do it um but yeah man polishing royal oak or anything genta is a real bitch i mean excuse my language it's awful but this is why i say you don't buy the watch you buy the dealer because if there's a problem your dealer takes care of you well yeah i mean hopefully there isn't a problem but you know things things happen and you know i'm going to be very honest i mean this is probably bad business but I've sold 140 watches, and one had an issue, you know, and it's it's remedied, but it just it happens. Absolutely, you know? these are mechanical things, and you know, just just like a car, stuff happens. So, but man, it is it is a beauty. And this is, I'd go for a colorful version myself. But you think you'll be upset if I wear it a little bit? We know. I don't think so. He watches the videos. He's not gonna care. No, it looks good. It's better than the Speedy, that's for sure. Oh, well, no, I love the Speedy, but I think for Miami it's better than the Speedy. Yeah, absolutely. You know what you need to do, though? You need to, like, put a white strap on it for Miami. Or, it's like, true. a yellow strap, you know, Miami it up. Or maybe, like, an orange hornback alligator. Well, absolutely. <laughs> but um, the real topic of this video, all right, Patek Philippe 5711. If you guys don't know what that is, Blue dot, specifically the blue dot. Specifically models. the blue dot, yes. Um, you guys know I've worked at a bunch of ADs. Matt here knows a bunch of ADs, and he has great connections in the watch world. And there's something going on with the 5711, you know, where it's been shooting up in price. Crazy. Almost yeah. double list. Exactly. So list is 24000 And I had a, a friend, Tom, Tried to buy it last year, and he said, Fed, I want a 5711. I said, Tom, used, it's going to cost you 30. And that was a good price because he's a, a good friend of mine. And he said, Fed, I'm not paying 30 for a used watch that's 24. I said, I totally respect that. He calls me a couple months ago. I was like, Fed, I want to buy a 5711. I'm like, Tom, it'll be 40. <laughs> yeah. And he said, Fed, I'm like, listen, I totally respect that. At that point, you should just say, you don't want a 5711. 
Well, it's just, <laughs> but I can understand where he's coming Absolutely from. Absolutely, I can understand where he's coming from. But the, the, here's the deal. If you are going to get a 5711 from your authorized dealer... Yeah, how does that work? You're the number one guy at the authorized dealer. Absolute you, number one. Absolute number one. Well, and once the number one guy has it, it, they'll go down the list. But you are their go-to client. When they have an anniversary, they're going to call you and you're going to buy a woman's paddock for your lady. Or you're probably buy jewelry there. You're, you're not just buying 5711s, 5712s. You're not just buying no. the paddocks that double in price. You're probably a jewelry client and you've spent other brands maybe. Other brands. You've spent a silly amount of money there. And you, it's almost like they're giving you a gift. And I, I find it crazy to say you're giving you a gift because you're spending a lot of money. But twenty four grand plus tax. But they're gonna give they're giving you twenty thousand dollars to put in your pocket if you wanted to sell it, which it's true. And actually, here's another thing: if you're that client and you sell that Patek, and Patek and, finds out, and Patek finds out, you're you're done. You're no longer that client. <laughs> yeah, you're no longer that client. I had somebody I sold. My one application piece in my career, an enamel world time. Okay. And fifty one thirty one. Fifty one thirty one, and the client sold it, and I didn't know. And my boss comes out. He calls me into the office. This is like four weeks later. He's like, Federico, tell me about this client. And I said, you know, well, what's going on? I'm not going to say bosses. He said, Thierry Stern just called me. They found us on Forty Seventh Street. And. You know, I qualified him. He was he's bought all this from us. He's like, he is no longer allowed to buy the tech fully built the store. It's just because that's why they're forty thousand for a Nautilus. Because there's no shortage of people that wanna buy it. That wanna buy it, they don't wanna wait, they don't they don't wanna buy ten other Pateks that they're going to lose money on if they ever had to liquidate them to to get the one at list, they would rather just go spend the forty thousand dollars or forty five thousand dollars it takes to buy a fifty seven eleven, and have it, and yeah. not wait. Well, here's here's a great question for you. Okay, you said you have to be the number one client to get a fifty seven eleven from an AD. Small ADs get one or two a year. One or two a year, yeah. Big ADs maybe four. Sure. Maybe five. Maybe 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 five. So if if it's that hard to get one on an AD, I'm talking some ADs of ten year wait. No joke, 10 year waiting list. Which at a certain point, why even take someone's name? No, you're just, yeah. you're just gonna upset that person when six years in, they exactly. haven't gotten a watch. And this is a real 10 year waiting list because Steel Daytona, people might say, oh, it's a five year waiting list. Uh, if, you, if you shop around, you can get a stainless you, steel you Daytona. You can get a stainless steel you may, Daytona. You may wait a month or two months or six months, but yeah. you can get one. But you can get one. If you should call the right AD, you'll get one. But a 5711, that's not happening. So how are they hitting the market? Like, if ADs don't have them, how are they out there? I think some ADs um, will sell to dealers. I know this for a mm -hmm. fact. Um, they, well, they, have some, they have some stock that they want to move. And, uh, okay, you take these three watches and you get this 5711. So three less desirable. Like less a, desirable. Like a gondolo, a ladies 24... And like an ellipse. Yeah, or, or, or I don't know, you know. Or perpetual calendars because perpetual calendars from Patek are very expensive and they the they just get smaller. It's much smaller market. Uh, or they will sell to a dealer at over list. Okay. It's, it's like if you they know they're gonna give you twenty thousand dollars when they sell you that watch, why not take a, a little bit of that cut? And I think it's probably more likely the first. It could be. The first. Kind yeah. of one, and and then usually that dealer sometimes sells it to another dealer. To another dealer who right? has the client. Who has the client? So the crazy thing is, these things might be selling at double the list, but it might go through three dealers that only make a thousand a piece. Which is why when somebody calls me and and they say, Federico, what can you do for me on the price? Listen, if it's an IWC or a Rolex or a Panerai. I'll happily figure something out that's mutually beneficial. Sure. But on a Protect Philippe, I'm not being an ass. It's just on 40000 I'm only making 1000 A 1000 yeah, which is 
Any other business that runs on that margin doesn't work. <laughs> but, but you are guaranteed. But, to, but it's, it's a, guaranteed thousand. Absolutely. And it's not even that you have to sell it to the end client because you have probably 20 dealers that can use that watch. Oh yeah, there's the dealer service. You send one text. If you need to get rid of a 5711, call me. And, and I <laughs> call, call, call him. Call me as well, guys. But but we, we do this all the time. Middle of the night, we'll send each other texts like, "Hey, do you need Definitely. this? Do you need that?" I mean, it's just which is how I've ended up with so many watches this early in the year. Yeah, what is it? Seven this year so far? I don't know. It's more than seven, but I don't know the exact number. What to clarify? I mean, I, I do sell some watches. You're not you. I wouldn't call you a full time dealer, but but you do sell watches. Yes, I sell some watches, but okay. I find myself keeping more watches than I sell. Fair enough. Well, guys, if you ever wondered about the 5711, that's kind of how it goes. The weight is real. It's probably the hardest production watch to get apart from maybe a Richard Meal or two. Yeah, absolutely. It, but what I would say is if you really want a 5711, just find the best one you can find at the best price and buy it because it's not going down. This is the one watch we're waiting does not pay. It's just a savings account on your wrist. You can wear it, you can enjoy it. If you wanted to turn around and sell it the very next day, you could call one or two dealers and one of them's gonna step up. Now, if you paid 40 for it, you're not gonna maybe sell it for 40, but maybe you sell it for 38. So Well, you're not gonna sell it for 40 the same year you bought it, but in a couple of years. In a couple of years, absolutely. I think so. Like I think so. And there is a rumor that they're going to increase the price by 20%. We'll there see is, what happens. There is. I think that's more believable than the rumor on the Rolex forum. This happens many times a year, and I've also just made a video about it. Rolex is decreasing production of their sports line. That's their bread and butter. That's it's the most like, retarded thing. Get out of here. Like, yeah. Get out of here, guys. When, you know, go to that. That's, but every six months, the Rolex forum has a, has a hissy fit about it. Uh, absolutely, or they're gonna they're gonna actually discontinue the Submariner. Yeah. <laughs> <laughs> do you have no? Do you know my phone calls I got? It, it, the rumor comes out, and then like within the ensuing days, I get four or five phone calls. If anything, stock is back at Rolex ADs uh, now. They replenish. Yeah. Sure, absolutely. Uh, but guys, long little episode today. But I have Maddie in town. I had to get him on camera. Please go check out. Turbion001. Yep, that's a Facebook group page. On Facebook and on Instagram. Yeah, on Instagram, yeah. Um, and also, if you're interested in any of these watches, I mean, I don't think they're all for sale, but hit, hit Matt up. I mean, you never know. Everything has a price. <laughs> Everything has a price. And of course, for more of the basic stuff sprinkled in with some of the higher end, but not that high end, DelrayWatch.com. Link in the description below. That's my website where I sell some pre owned watches. Guys, thank you so much, and we'll catch you in the next one. Thanks, guys. Take care.